Amen. Well, you may be seated. Welcome here this morning. Welcome to those who are online. I'm James. I'm uh, the other half of that Wittenberg duo, and it is my joy to open up Scripture with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can already open them up to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we're going to be starting right at the beginning there. As we talk for our fourth Sunday and our final Sunday about prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, there was a a boy, a young boy who was sent by his mother to a time out. And after he had served the allotted time, he came back to his mom and said, Mom, you know, I had some time to think. And I prayed. I prayed for strength. And his mom said, great, you know, if you pray to God for strength, he'll give you strength to be good. Oh, said the boy, I I didn't pray for strength for me to be good, but I prayed that God would give you strength to put up with me. (laughs) Lord, teach us to pray. Now, over these last couple of weeks, we have been looking at prayer from the Master's lips. We've been learning from Jesus how to pray. And we began with the idea of who. That the controlling element of prayer is the who. That we pray to our Father. Our good Father in heaven who knows us and who loves us and is more willing to give than we are to ask. And the who shapes the why. We come to prayer because God invites us into his presence, into a relationship with him in which we are formed into his likeness. And the who shapes the what. That when we pray, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. We pray God's agenda that his name would be glorified. And his provision, his pardon, his uh, providence or his protection all points toward his glory. And today we talk about the how. And again how the who shapes the how. And actually, Jesus tells us how to pray right there in verse 1. This parable has no guesses about it. The answer is right there. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. To pray with persistence and not lose heart. Now, I think this last season has been marked by losing heart. You know, with all the uncertainties and the ups and downs, masks, no masks, space, no space, vacations, work, worship gatherings, there's just been a lot of of changes and people are tired. And then you add to that uh, politics and finances and family and bickering and opinions. And I think people have lost heart. And I, I, I think, though there's more to it, that I think this truth is, is that we lo- we've, this season has been marked by losing heart, but life is tough, including our spiritual life. And when we approach life like a sprint and not like a marathon, well, then we run into troubles because life is like a marathon. Now, when I uh, grew up in Vancouver, we would have these citywide track meets at Swangard Stadium. And I remember uh, one time a girl and the pistol went off and she was off like a shot. And she came to the 100 meter marks first. She raised her hands and her face was filled with joy. But unfortunately, the race was the 400 meter. (laughs) And soon that smile faded as she faded to the back of the pack. And sometimes I see that in people's experience, whether it's with a new job, a new relationship, marriage, or with their Christian walk. People start off with a bang and, you know, giving fist pumps in the air and happy. And then life happens. Uh, Difficulties. Disappointments. 
discouragements. And some people continue to run strong. Others walk with a limp. And some leave the race altogether. So how do we find the strength to keep going and not lose heart? Prayer. Jesus told this parable that they might always pray and not lose heart. Isn't Jesus good? He is true God and true man, and he knows us. He knows our struggles. He knows our temptation to stop praying, to give up, and to lose heart. Because it's tough to keep on praying. When you pray and you pray and you pray for your husband... And he refuses to yield his life to Jesus. When you pray and you pray and you pray for your daughter. And she continues on in her stubborn way. Even though there's a string of train wrecks behind her. And you pray and you pray and you pray for a child. For a spouse. For a clean bill of health. It's hard to keep praying. And these situations um, are realistic. Some of you live there. But it's characteristic of Jesus to reach in through the darkness and through the fog and lift us up to a higher plane where we can see God and we can see the situation in a new light. That's what this parable does. Now, full disclosure... This was not my favorite parable growing up. I didn't like this. I loved Luke 15, Luke 18, not so much. This one is about a widow and an unjust judge. And the widow finally gets justice because she pesters the judge. And so this is what prayer is. Pestering God again and again and again until he gets up, gets off his keister, and actually does something about it. Do you think that's what prayer is? Do you think that's what God is like? See, if you think that, then soon you do stop praying. And you do lose heart. Now, the light came on for me when I realized that this was a a parable of contrast and not comparison. That God is nothing like the unjust judge. And as we see that in this story, uh, my prayer is that you would be encouraged and that you would not lose heart. So let's get to the parable, uh, verse 2, the Uh, The heartless judge. Jesus said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Now in, uh, in the Israelite law there was judges appointed in every town because justice was important. And this judge was a self-made man. Somebody who pulled, him up by the, pulled himself up by the bootstraps. Uh, someone who neither feared God didn't, or didn't care about what others said. Now it might sound good, an unbiased judge, but far from it. In the Roman world... If you didn't fear God, uh, this was considered a, a, an insult. Because soon after not fearing God, you would stop caring about what people said. And then you'd stop caring about people, period. And in Luke's world, this would be the definition of wickedness. Jesus said, the command for the good life were twofold. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. And this judge denies them both. And what's more, he knows it. In verse 4, he says to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. I mean, there's scoundrels out there who lack self-awareness. They think they're pretty good guys. Not this judge. This judge, he's a scoundrel and he knows it. He is a heartless judge, and she is a helpless widow. Verse 3, and there was a widow in that city 
who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. Now in Jesus' time, widows had no power. They were at the low end of the pecking order, the red end of this power spectrum. Uh, in fact, in both Testaments, widows were the icon of adult vulnerability. They were destitute and needy and often oppressed. And although it is better in our age for widows, it still remains that we should have our eyes open for them. This was a small minnow in a big ocean of sharks. And she had a shark, an adversary. See, oftentimes uh, a man would come and, and buy a widow's property far under value and displace her from it. And with the drop of a gavel, this woman could be reduced to poverty. She, was, she had an adversary and she had persistence. You know what she lacked in power? She made up for in persistence. She had pluck, right? She kept going. It reads, she kept coming to him. Now, this is in the imperfect in Greek, and that means it's repeated again and again. She came and she came and she came to the judge with this simple plea. Give me victory over my adversary. And you can imagine it. The judge drives up in his BMW to his, uh, to his work building. He takes the elevator up to the penthouse, goes into the office, looking out those expansive windows at the view of the river. He makes himself a, a fresh cup of coffee from his Bosch 800 and sits down, opens up his computer to look at the stock numbers when his secretary buzzes him and says, Sir, there's somebody here to see you. Well, he goes out and looks into the waiting room, and there she is, this raggedy woman. He looks over at his secretary and growls, today is your last day, and turns around and goes back into his office and slams the door behind him. And that weekend, the whole family goes down to Regina for a Rough Riders game. He got box seats to look the other way, but they weren't so much sitting as standing. The game was a nail biter, as most Rough Rider games are. And uh, this game proved consistent. It went into overtime, but as everybody was standing up, one of the ushers came and said, excuse me, judge, there's somebody on the private line for you. you. You could take it just outside. And so he walks out and he picks up the phone and it's her. While the long stream of colorful language that he speaks is drowned out by the cheer of the crowd. He rushes back in only to find out that the game is over. A quarterback sneak by Fajardo sealed the deal. Rough riders again. <laughs> he goes home after a long day and settles down in his leather Stanford. He pours himself a single malt scotch and opens up his computer to see his personal emails. And his inbox is filled from her, give me justice. Enough, he says. You win. Verse 4, for a while he refused. Again, in the imperfect, he refused, he refused, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. 
I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down. It's a brilliant word picture here. The, the word, the, the actual word means to blacken the eye. And it's not as if this uh, babushka has a mean uh, right hook or that grandma is going to be waiting in a dark alley for this judge to come out and pull the jersey over the head and start the lawnmower. You know, it's a figurative language that, uh, that his eyes will be blackened because he has no rest. Or it could be that his reputation is blackened because she comes again and again he is shamed. By his peers. Now it could be that the, this was a story of what really happened. And that Jesus heard about a widow who got justice. Because she nagged and nagged and nagged. But surely this is not what Jesus is saying. That if you want to get something from God. Then you have to nag and nag and nag. Verse 6. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? It's a contradiction. See what Jesus, Jesus is not saying to nag. He's saying not to lose heart. That you know how to get justice in your own case. When it's your personal cause, you don't give up. When a student gets a, a mark uh, lower than what they think they deserve, they go to their teacher again and again and again until she raises it to that A-. minus. When the CRA has given, uh, hasn't given you your tax refund back, you call again and again and again until they finally send the money. When you've told your kids that you're going to go to Disneyland in a couple of years, they ask again and again and again until you can't put it off anymore. You don't give up. On your justice. Why do you give up. On God. See it's a contradiction. This unjust judge. Is nothing like God. God is greater. Than this judge. He is your father who knows you. Who loves you. Who doesn't give up on you. Why would you give up on him. You see. Uh, we are not to give up. And, and then Jesus makes this statement. This you can abet the farm on it statement. He says, I tell you. When Jesus says that, listen closely. Verse 8. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Jesus says, he will give justice. But speedily? Speedily, Jesus? The whole point of this parable was because there was a long delay. That they should keep praying and not give up. Speedily? Well, I think sometimes we confuse speedily and soon. See, soon is thinking of God like Amazon. Where you go... And you click on what you want and it goes into the cart and it'll be delivered to you in 7 to 12 business days. That's soon. Speedily is quickly or instantaneously. That there may be a delay, but then it comes. And it comes right away. That's the context in here. It's of the Lord's return. That when he comes, it may delay, but he will come speedily. And we've seen this in answers to prayer. Where we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed for a mom. And suddenly, she comes to know Jesus. Where we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed for a young man. And suddenly... The grip of his addiction is broken. 
where we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed for reconcile, a reconciliation between two couples. And suddenly, there's forgiveness. He will give justice speedily. So let me draw from this three application points to encourage you to keep praying and not lose heart. All right? The first, keep praying because God is at work. God is at work. Sometimes when we pray and there's a delay, we think that God isn't working, that, that he's snoozing, that it's, uh, he's, there's inactivity. But God is at work beyond what we can see. It's, uh, it's beyond our eyes, but we know that God is at work, answering our prayers, moving in people's lives, even when we don't see it. Many of you are here today because of prayers said for you. For me, it was my mom. He is at work. Though it tarries, it will come. And another side of that was a new insight uh, that was presented to me. And it's given me great hope in my prayers. Let me share it with you. It's that uh, God is already answering prayers that have yet to be said. Let me say that again. God's already answering the prayers that we haven't said. And let me show you where I find that. It's throughout scriptures, but let me show you one example of it. Exodus 2. If you turn back, take a hard right, go back to Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23. Okay? Context. People are in Israel. They've been there for 400 years. Verse 23, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. They prayed and God heard. And God resolved to set them free. And then God began to act? No. Before they prayed, before verse 23, there's 23 verses before that. There's 80 years before that. Before they prayed, 80 years before, a young Hebrew boy was saved from Pharaoh's sword, put into a basket by his mother and found by the princess. He was brought up in the Pharaoh's courts so that he could know the Egyptian language and know the Egyptian way. Forty years before this prayer was uttered, God was answering their prayers. This same man was brought through the deserts to the land of Midian. He knew the lay of the land. He knew how to go through here. Can you put up the slide about his uh, journey? This is Moses' journey. It reflects the journey that the people took out of, out of Egypt to Mount Sinai. Eighty years before the people began this prayer, before they had said a word, God was answering it. God is already answering prayers that you have not said. Isn't that amazing? In 1974, a group gathered in uh, Osler to pray about a, a, a chapel, a church there. But 40 years before that, a young boy was born in Hague. Cornelius Gunther, who was there to lead that people. For they said a prayer. God was already answering it. This summer, we've been praying for a, a children's assistant. But 28, 29 years. Right, honey? <laughs> In Brazil. A young girl was born to grow up to know Jesus and love him and love children. 
God is already answering prayers that have yet to be said. So keep praying because God is at work. Amen? Amen. That's number one. Number two, keep praying because God is for you. Sometimes we think God is not answering because he's, uh, he's angry with us, that he doesn't know us, that he doesn't like us. Now, we are not like that widow. The widow was removed from the judge. He didn't know her. He didn't like her. Six degrees of separation, but still he gave her justice. But there's a contrast here. We are not like that widow. God knows us. And do you see the language that, uh, that Jesus used? Will God not give justice to his elect? To those that are chosen. Those that he knows. God watches your news feed. You are his news feed. He knows you. He knows your story. He loves you. God is for you. And if you know Jesus, then not only have you been washed of your sins, but you've been brought into the family. You can call God dad. Now, like any good parent, the father doesn't always say yes to our prayers. Right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked three times for this cup to be removed. But God had something greater in mind. A rescue not only for a, a nation, but for the world. But every time we come in prayer, we never leave empty-handed. Every time, God gives us something. He gives us more of himself. He gives us grace. To endure. Keep praying. Because God is for you. And keep praying. Because you need God. I said this is contrast. But there is something that we have in common with the widow. That we have a need. That we have a deep debt. That we cannot pay. We all of us need forgiveness. And what's more, we have an adversary. One who is more powerful than us. Peter said that the devil prowls around like a lion looking for those that he can devour. Jesus said he's a thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So we... Needed a rescuer. But long before we prayed that prayer. God was already working. Preparing for us a rescue. And at the right time he came. To undo the works of the devil. To free the captives from bondage. To bring justice. And shalom. You see, we need God's help. We cannot overcome on our own. And thanks be to God, he has provided. And those who know their need, keep praying. So keep praying. Because you need God. What's interesting is that Jesus ends this parable with a challenge. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He lays out who God is, our Father who loves us. He lays out who we are, those that need him. And he asks, will you pray? Will you pray? Not constantly, but consistently. Will you pray for, for justice, for his kingdom to come? See, West Portal, I think that beginning uh, phrase has in it promise that those who continue to pray 
will also not lose heart. So let us keep praying and not lose heart. Amen? Amen. Well, as we, uh, as we said there, we need a rescuer. We need an advocate. Someone who can stand up for us, who can stand in our place. And at the right time, Jesus came for us. And we are invited to come to him. Not because of our goodness, but because of his grace. Not because we chose him, but because he chose us. And that we are his children. And we can come to our father just as we are. So we want to participate in the Lord's meal together. If you have your little travel pack uh, communion set, uh, you can get that out now. The wafer is right in the top. Don't be uh, fooled. It's right up there. You can open that thing up. If you need a wafer or a, a pack, you can wave and the ushers will come and bring you one. If you'd like a gluten-free option, you can raise your hand and uh, we have some gluten-free as well. Is there any gluten-free? Okay. Just uh, persevere. You will receive. <laughs> Do you want to pass out the, uh, the gluten-free option? Wonderful. Uh, right there in the back, John. And then Leslie... Right over here, Leslie is perfect. Well, on that night, when Jesus went out to undo the works of the devil, he had a meal with his disciples in an upper room. And during that meal, he took a, a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you pronounce the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Let us pray. Father, Father, you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You are good, so good. And we thank you that you know us and that you care for us. And Lord, we are sorry where we have thought of you too small or too selfish where we have painted you in colors like ourselves. And we're sorry where we have not loved you with all our heart. Where we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Where we have contributed to the injustice around us. Lord, have mercy and forgive us. And you do. That's why you came. So that we could be reconciled to you. 
so that we could know your delight in our lives and walk as your children in this world. And Lord, we ask you to bring justice in our lives and in our city. Lord, that those that are lost, those that are hurting, those that are oppressed, Lord, that their eyes may be open to see you and that you might bring the healing and hope that you have come to give. Lord, we pray for justice for our brothers and sisters in this world, especially those in Afghanistan. Lord, deliver them. Be close. Lord, bless your people that you might use us to be the answer of prayers that are yet to be said. We ask this in the name of our advocate and our defender, Jesus Christ. Amen.